Understanding Women Part 3 Published on August 18, 2011, by Carl Donk This is the third part of my article on Understanding Women. If you haven't yet read the previous parts, I recommend reading them first so that you can better understand the rest of this third part. Humanity has been hijacked. To a very great degree we've lost our beautiful women, who were both pure at heart and at mind. The kind of women we can now only read about in fantasy stories. This was done on purpose in order to frustrate our lives so that it would be easy to control and manipulate us. Believe it or not, we've been like this for thousands of years now. When you do enough research you'll quickly discover ancient stories and legends that mention how humanity was deliberately divided in order to control us. There are ancient stories from Africa that mention how a long time ago gods came from the sky one day in large orbs, and how they divided men and women in order to control them. Even in the Bible you can read about how Eve was misled by a snake, and how as a result life became a lot more difficult for both Adam and Eve. And there are more examples, but this goes beyond the scope of this post. Check my post Sexual Suppression and Repression 1, Definition, and origin for more details on this. Suffice it to say that the issues between men and women go back many thousands of years. What is clear is that their attack vector included our women and our sexuality, or in other words, the way men and women connect with each other at the highest and most intimate level. You have to understand that when it comes to divide and conquer strategies, nothing can divide the human race more than when you do it at the level of the sexes. It divides the human race at the very core of its existence. Whoever did this to us knew exactly what they were doing. And when I mention that they targeted our sexuality, I don't just mean the physical part of it, but also the emotional or mental aspect. And both of them are very important. We're prevented from experiencing love to the fullest without our minds being contaminated by all the brainwashing. Those who are responsible for these issues, and who are now in control, appear to be so confident of the control that they have over us that they even tell us exactly how they are controlling us. They are essentially saying, look, this is what we're doing to you, and there's nothing you can do about it. David Icke often mentions this during his talks. It's like in the movies where the villain captures the hero, and before killing him, starts to elaborate on his plans first. Imagine the confidence they must have to be able to do this. When you consider that they've been controlling us for thousands of years now, it becomes easier to understand their confidence. If we haven't been able to fight back for so long, we're probably not going to succeed any time soon. One way of how they are showing us what they are doing to us is through stories and movies. The movie The Matrix comes to mind, but there are also many fairy tales and fantasy stories that tell us what they are doing to us without most people realizing it. One of those fantasy stories is called The Never Ending Story. I saw the movie based on The Never Ending Story when I was very young and loved it. But I never realized its true meaning until recent years. The Never Ending Story begins by showing exactly what they've done to us. When the story begins, we quickly learn that Bastion, a young boy who is the central character, lost his mother and is trying hard to deal with the loss. To a young boy the most important woman in his life at that age is his mother. So here they are showing us right from the start that we've lost something very important to us, namely our women. Bastion is stuck being alone with his dad, who doesn't seem to care much about what Bastion is going through and only seems to be interested in reminding Bastion about his responsibilities, much like our society. Bastion needs to stop dreaming, stay on his feet, and do what society demands of him. When Bastion walks on the street later on his way to school, he's stopped by bullies who call him a weirdo and attack him. This is symbolic for when we're on our way to learn about life, and the rest of society seeing us as weirdos and attacking or mistreating us in various ways. Once you start to learn about what's going on, you automatically set yourself apart from the normal crowd and appear different or weird to them. 
It's like Morpheus says to Neo in the movie, The Matrix. Quote. But when you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters. The very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inured, so hopelessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. End quote. In other words, if on your journey to learn about life you begin to wake up and start to point out what you see, you'll be seen as a weirdo, and will be attacked by society. Bastion runs away from the bullies, and tries to hide in a bookshop. The owner of the bookshop first tries to send Bastion away, telling him he shouldn't be there because there's nothing there that would interest him. Just small rectangular objects called books, that will require effort on his part. This is symbolic for the fact that most in our society, aren't really interested in reading and learning and prefer to party and play instead, while staying in their ignorance. But Bastion proves to the owner of the bookshop that he's very interested in books, and then asks about a specific book in the hands of the owner. The owner then explains to Bastion that it is a very special book, not like other books Bastion is used to. In other books you become the hero while reading, and then after reading it, you become yourself again, and continue your own life. As the hero in the stories in those books, you can go through all kinds of dangerous situations, and not worry because, after all, they are just stories. But in this special book, that's not the case. Why not? Because this book tells Bastion, tells us, about our own lives. When Bastion later reads the book, he is in fact reading about his own life. The hero, Atreyu, in the book is really Bastion himself. And while we look at the movie, we are in fact looking at a movie about our own lives. We're both Bastion and Atreyu. This is mentioned again at the end of the movie, when Atreyu talks to the Empress, and she says to him, Quote, He doesn't realize he's already part of the never-ending story. Just as he shares all your adventures, others are sharing his. They were with him when he hid from the boys in the bookstore. They were with him when he took the book with the Auron symbol on the cover, in which he's reading his own story right now. End quote. So it is made very clear to us that when we read the never-ending story, we're actually reading about ourselves. It's a story about us, about our own lives. They are showing us what they are doing to us. And when we're finished reading the book the story doesn't end for us because our lives are the story. That's why the owner of the bookstore mentions to Bastion that the other books he knows are safe, but that this special book wasn't. There's no escaping back to reality from the dangerous situations in this book. We're living those situations every day. So if you had any doubt about whether the story in the book was about our reality, then this should remove all doubts. When Bastion starts reading the never-ending story, he finds out at the very beginning that the Empress of Fantasia, the world in which the story takes place, has become deadly ill. This is again symbolic for the fact that they've made our women sick with all the brainwashing. It's also interesting that the Empress in the story is a child, a young girl, no doubt showing us that they've been making our women ill, starting from early childhood. Remember that in the first part of this article, I mentioned how the brainwashing starts from very early childhood. And so the hero in the story, Atreyu, spends the rest of the story trying to deal with the problems this creates for the world of Fantasia, and tries to find a solution to what is causing all the problems. On his journey he goes through places like the Desert of Shattered Hopes, and the Swamps of Sadness, no doubt symbolism, for what we go through in our daily lives, because of all the frustrations we have to deal with in search for answers. At the same time, we're constantly kept in fear, symbolized in the story by the creature of darkness who follows a trail everywhere. War, terrorists, AIDS, religion, financial crisis, Justin Bieber etc., there's a lot to fear in our world. Throughout the years, fear has been one of the primary tools used by those in control to motivate 
and manipulate the masses. And in the end, like most fairy tales, Atreyu finds his way back to the Empress and finally has sex with her, after essentially having gone on a wild goose chase. Because, and I couldn't make this up, when Atreyu finally gets back, the Empress tells Atreyu that she knew what the solution to the problem was all along. So Atreyu, realizing that he unnecessarily went through a great deal of trouble, rightfully gets angry and goes. Quote, you knew about this all along. My horse died, I nearly drowned, I just barely got away from the nothing. For what? To find out what you already knew. End quote. Like I said in the first part of this series on understanding women, women are being programmed to make it especially difficult for a man to get closer to them. Even if there's absolutely no logical reason for it. You'll come across this everywhere. This is similar to when a guy really goes out of his way to impress a girl, only for her to tell him in the end that she was interested in him all along, but said nothing on purpose just to see how far he would go for her. Only after Atreyu went through all kinds of difficulties for the Empress that weren't necessary did he, at last, get to have sex with the Empress. And yes, he has sex with her, though that's not what you explicitly see in the movie. But all the symbolism points to sex. First of all, the entrance to the Empress's ivory tower looks like a giant vagina. Just take a look at the picture below. Atreyu enters the vagina, and then arrives in the uterus where the Empress sits on her throne. Now, in case you're still in doubt of where we are at this point, the walls around the throne are decorated with figures that clearly resemble vaginas, leaving us with absolutely no doubt whatsoever that we have, in fact, penetrated into a vagina. As if all this isn't enough, during what appears to be the orgasm, when the entire uterus is shaking and cracking and lightning strikes outside because of all the energy building up to the climax, Bastion has to call out the Empress's name. And of course, it's raining during the climax while Bastion yells out her name. I don't have to explain the rain to you, do I? Have you heard about the concept of rain impregnating Mother Earth? All righty then. Just seconds after the rather violent climax, everything quickly calms down again, exactly like you would expect. Bastion then replaces Atreyu, because they are really the same person in the story, remember we're reading about ourselves. And the Empress gives a small glowing grain of sand to Bastion, resembling a seed. And then a new life is born, and there's a new beginning. Bastion then heads out again temporarily experiencing how great life feels when you've just unloaded all your sexual energy, only to prepare himself for another round of manipulation ahead. Because like the narrator says at the end, Bastion will have to return to the ordinary world. And once he's there, the cycle starts all over again. This is why the story is called The Never-Ending Story, It Really Never Ends and why on the cover of the book you have the Auron symbol of the snakes that are eating themselves in an endless loop. The Auron symbol is a complexer version of the Ouroboros. Quote, The Ouroboros often represents self-reflexivity or cyclicality, especially in the sense of something constantly recreating itself, the eternal return, and other things perceived as cycles that begin anew as soon as they end. The mythical phoenix has a similar symbolism. End quote. What they are telling us here is first that we're reading a story about ourselves, self-reflexivity or self-reference. The fact that there are two Ouroboros symbols intertwined tells us that there are two levels of self-reference here. Bastion is reading about himself, but we're also reading about ourselves at the same time. Secondly, the cyclicality of the Ouroboros tells us that we're in an endless loop of control and manipulation. This concept was also clearly present in the Matrix movies, and explained in much more detail there. When Neo finally meets the architect in the movie, the architect explains to Neo that this was not the first time that they met, and that in fact there were many Neos before him. Neo then sees the Neos that came before him in small screens on the wall. This same concept can also be seen in the never-ending story. At the end, when Atreyu enters a place where he sees drawings on the walls around him depicting him in every situation, 
that he had experienced, the whole story up until that point, including the future. This is only possible when there were many Atreus before him, and his path was pretty much planned and set in stone even before he began his journey. And that's what the architect explains to Neo in The Matrix when they meet. There can be slight variations, but overall the same cycle keeps repeating itself. The system of control and manipulation was designed to give us a limited amount of freedom to maintain the illusion of choice, but as a result, and by design, in the long term, this would eventually lead to more and more people waking up and getting behind what was really going on. So measures were built into the system to effectively deal with this process and control it once it would inevitably happen. Neo was essentially created by the Matrix itself to deal with the problem of people waking up. By prophesying to everyone that he would be the one, the Messiah who would save them all, everyone would follow him when he arrived, and as a result, the Matrix would have control over the process, because they controlled Neo. This is why Neo was able to stop Sentinels in the real world. He was part of the plan to lead humanity back to the beginning of the cycle of control, and that's how the Matrix trilogy ends. And since this cycle has happened so many times, it has constantly been perfected. As the architect explains to Neo, they've destroyed Zion, the Resistance, so many times that they have become increasingly efficient at it. Perhaps this also explains their confidence in showing us what they are doing, because they think we're not going to be able to do much about it. The fact that these days so much information is becoming available, and many more people begin to realize that there's something seriously wrong with the world we live in should worry us. It should worry us because when this happens, it means that a reboot isn't far away. The current situation gets destroyed, and we set back at the beginning to start the journey all over again. Maybe the theories about the end of the world, as we know it in 2012 do have some validity after all. It's interesting that the first Matrix movie, where they show us how we're being controlled, was released in 1999, 13 years before 2012. The number 13 is a special number in Freemasonry. When you do enough research you'll discover that the people who are behind all of this control and manipulation go by the name of the Illuminati and or Freemasons. Check out the works of Jordan Maxwell, David Icke and Alex Jones on this subject. If you think sex in children's stories is unique to the never-ending story, then I've got news for you. It's not. The Illuminati and or Freemasons seem to be fixated on human sexuality. And this should come as no surprise to you having read the first two parts of this article. Check out the movie below on YouTube for a few examples of sexual messages in some of Disney's animations. These are called subliminal messages, and they work on our subconscious. They influence us without us consciously realizing that we are being influenced. This is yet another example of their sexual manipulation. Disney was a 33 degrees Freemason, and all of these messages in their animations serve a purpose, read about it here. There's a lot of energy in human sexuality. A lot of the rituals the Illuminati and or Freemasons perform involve men, women, and even children in sexual acts. Again, do your own research and check out the works of Jordan Maxwell, David Icke, and Alex Jones. Alex Jones has a couple of documentaries on this with live footage. In public these people remain politically correct, but behind closed doors is where they put their sexual perversions into practice. I already mentioned the book Trance, Formation of America, in one of the previous parts of this article but I'm going to recommend it to you again. Get it and find out what's happening. But getting back to the subject of women, the never-ending story is a clear example where they're showing us what they've done to us with regard to our women. They have corrupted our women in order to frustrate our lives so that we become easier to control and manipulate. It's very interesting that simultaneously, with the release of the movie based on the never-ending story, the young actress Tammy Stranach, who plays the Empress in the movie, released an album with two songs titled Fairy Queen and Riding on a Rainbow. If you listen to these two songs, the text also tells you a lot about the issues we're dealing with right now. 
let's look at the lyrics for the song Fairy Queen. Quote, If I could be a fairy queen, then I would hold a magic key to reveal the hidden secrets of the mind. Then I could see the darkest blue, the mystery that's part of you, and I'd weave a spell to take away your sorrows. End quote. It's very cruel that they had a young girl sing this song to us, and more so because it's the same girl who played the sick empress in the movie. It's like chopping off someone's hands and then letting that person sing about wishing to have a pair of hands. First they brainwash these young girls everywhere, making them become much less of the person that they could really be. Then they have this young girl sing to us, how she wishes that she could be a fairy queen, or in other words, how she wishes that she could be a real woman, the kind of woman that we've lost and can now only read about in fantasy stories. She tells us that if she could be such a woman, she would be able to reveal the hidden secrets of the mind. This makes sense, since without all the brainwashing going on from early childhood, women would realize their true nature and their true desires, the secrets of the mind that are now hidden behind all the brainwashing. And if women were capable of breaking out of the mind control and see the hidden secrets of the mind, they'd see the world so much better, their minds would become pure again, free from all the deep-seated feelings of anger and frustration. They'd understand us and would most certainly be able to take away our sorrows. Quote, Fairy Queen, changing teardrops to a smile, holding daydreams for a while. Fairy Queen, she's your shelter in the night, the guardian angel by your side. End quote. Such a woman would indeed be able to change teardrops to a smile and enable us to dream again. And she would most certainly be our shelter in the night and a guardian angel by our sides, looking after us and caring for us. Quote, if I could be a fairy queen, I'd find the long forgotten dream that is deep inside the memory of a child. If I could hear what words don't tell from way down in the wishing well, then reality would turn into illusion. End quote. Again, they couldn't have made this text clearer for us to understand. The long-forgotten dreams deep inside the memory of a child are our repressed desires due to all the brainwashing starting from early childhood. The wishing well is a metaphor for our subconscious which resides way down in our minds. If women could hear the message from their subconscious, if they could hear what their subconscious desired and wished for, then reality would indeed turn into illusion. They'd find out about their true nature and realize that they have been living an illusion all this time, an illusion that they thought was reality. Quote, If I could be a fairy queen, I'd take a walk behind the scene where the puppet acting plays that never ends. I'd pull their strings to set them free, they'd play their parts most perfectly, and my magic wand would make them live forever. End quote. If we wake up and start to see the illusion, we get a glimpse behind the scenes where all the control takes place. We start to recognize and see how we're being controlled and manipulated. And so indeed, a fairy queen would be able to go behind the scenes to see how the puppets, all of us, are being controlled. Not only that, she'd also be able to set us free from all the control and manipulation. But sadly, all of that, only if women could be fairy queens again. Will we ever get back our fairy queens? Thank you for listening. This article was originally published on Carl Donk's blog at blog.carldonk.com. Remember to visit for regular updates. You can also find this content published on archive.org and lbry.tv. Remember to save a local copy of this video and any other content that you would like to continue to have access to in the future. You never know, those goddamn motherfuckers in big tech might censor this content in the future.